This is Letter from America. Today's topic is what will Zimbabweans do about the massive gold looting by Mnangagwa and ZANU-PF? The long-awaited exposure by Al Jazeera about the massive multi-million dollar gold smuggling ring has begun. But the news about corruption in Zimbabwe has been around for many years. Zimbabweans are acutely aware that Munangagwa Suzanu PF government are looting billions of dollars of taxpayers' money every year. The only news in Al Jazeera's exposure is how the looting was taking place or is taking place. Munangagwa and Zanu PF hypocrisy has been exposed. In their political pronouncements, Munangagwa and Zanu PF like to say that Zimbabwe will never be a colony again. Yet Al Jazeera showed how white people and Indians are involved in laundering money from, from God's gold sales in Dubai. In fact, white people and Indians are the masterminds of this corruption. Munangagwa and Zaru PF are paid partners in this criminal enterprise. There is a criminal partnership in which Mdangagwa and Zanu PF use their political power to facilitate the illegal shipment of gold, while the whites and Indians actually sell the gold and pay the Dizzy Ribachinoi gang. What was revealed was Mdangagwa and Zanu PF are paid a lot less than what the whites and Indians get paid from this Zimbabwe from this gold that has been smuggled from Zimbabwe. For the masses of Zimbabwe, the key issue is they have been impoverished by this criminal gang. According to a renowned economist, nearly half the country's population is living in abject poverty since November 2017 coup, which toppled the late Robert Mugabe. This poverty rate has doubled since Munangagwa took over as president. Professor Gift Mugani said in an interview that in 2018, 29% or one third of Zimbabweans were living in extreme poverty. Today, Four years under the Munangagwa government, 49% of Zimbabweans now live in extreme poverty. Other records indicate that in the 42 years ZANU-PF has been in power, an estimated 70% of Zimbabweans now live in poverty. Virtually the entire population now survives on an informal economy. Mnangagwa and his finance minister Mtuli Nube, as well as the ZANU-PF leadership, do not take advice from economists. The highly publicized meetings between government and industry representatives is a false narrative aimed at giving the misleading impression that government is listening to stakeholders, this economist said. He added that this is totally false. Professor Mugano said government economic policies are not based on inputs from stakeholders, but decisions within the ZANU-PF Aparachiki. The so-called Transitional Stabilization Plan, or TSP, that was launched in 2018 was a 300-page document that Mtulingube brought with him from his home base in Switzerland. It was not a product of stakeholders' consultation and input. It was never made available for review or consultation but was implemented immediately. 
A number of economists criticized Mtulinube for imposing the plan without local input or taking local conditions into consideration. Today, the results of this plan are a clear evidence of the plan's abject failure to achieve its intended objectives to supposedly stabilize the dollar. According to Professor Mugano, in the four years the plan has been enacted, inflation for 2020 shot up by 800%. In 2018, 29% of Zimbabweans were in poverty. Now the figure has doubled to 49%. The vast majority of workers live below poverty datum line or PDL. Zimbabwe was in 2018 a mid income lower class country. Today, Zimbabwe is way below the mid income uh, level country. And all of this has happened during Nube's transitional stabilization plan, the professor said. Domestic debt has spiraled to 20 US billion dollars. This is double what it was four years ago. The domestic debt is projected to spiral to double in three years' time. To make matters worse, Zimbabweans do not know where this debt was acquired from and what it was used for. There has been no accountability by government. The bottom line is Munangagwa and the ZANU-PF government have failed dismally to run and manage Zimbabwe's economy. The solution? The professor was asked, well, the answer was obvious. It's time to change government. He pointed out that SATIC countries have had several presidents since their independence. Zimbabwe has had only one, Robert Mugabe, until 2017. His successor, Emerson Munangagwa, is even worse. Professor Mugano listed the failures of the plan, the transitional uh, stabilization plan, by pointing to an economy that is in dire straits. First, the economy is running on three exchange rate systems for the Zimbabwean US dollar. There is the parallel or black market with its exchange rate of 350 Zimbabwean dollars to one US dollar. And this is quickly rising to 500 to one US dollar. Next, there is the government auction rate at 155 Zimbabwean dollars to one US dollar. And next, there is the interbank rate at 240 Zimbabwean dollars to one US dollar. Both government and interbank rates are controlled by a cartel of government officials and bankers. The big problem, according to this professor, is having three exchange rate systems in one economy undermines the local currency. Money plays a key role in economic growth. Professor Mugano said the money has two essential functions as a store of value and a medium of exchange. The three exchange rate, rates that are currently in Zimbabwe today distort the functions of money. As a result, the market and the Zimbabweans are soundly rejecting the Zimbabwean dollar, yet the government is forcing it on them. Again, Professor Mugano stressed the market and the people are rejecting 
the Zimbabwean dollar. Yet government is not listening to economists. Instead, Mnangagwa regime is using political rhetoric to rationalize its policies. One such rhetoric is that the country has a budget surplus, as Mnube would like to remind Zimbabweans over and over and over again. Incidentally, Finance Minister Ngube and his family live in Switzerland. While in Zimbabwe, he lives in an expensive hotel paid for fully by the government. This raises questions about Ngube's confidence in the country's economy. Professor Magano said Zimbabwe never had a surplus. The so-called surplus that Ngube keeps on reminding Zimbabweans about over and over again is an artificial creation concocted by compressing wages of the working class, making them even poorer. Munangagwa had signed more than 600 statutory interest instruments to control the economy. The Zimbabwe economy is now being run on subsidies and statutory instruments. The government has not come up with a roadmap to stabilize the Zimbabwe dollar. Professor listed some of the conditions that must prevail if the Zimbabwe dollar is to stabilize. One, inflation must be in a single digit. There is a need for a de-dollarization roadmap. There must be a social contract where business and government and other stakeholders work together and tackle the root causes of the economic problems. Right now, the government is unable to identify root cause and is instead, instead the root cause of the problem and is instead dealing with the symptoms of the economic malaise. The government is unable to come up with evidence-based consultative and science-based policies that will dynamically handle, deal with the root causes of the economic problems in Zimbabwe. The so-called meetings ostensibly to show that government is consulting with a uh, business sector are a mere show off, Professor Mugano said. He said Gav Munangagwa does not listen to any inputs. The Munangagwa government has what he called a permanent disease of misgovernance. CCC or Triple C Vice President Tendai Biti earlier this year said government has a very poor investment strategy. Sectors that needed good budgetary support are being underfunded. Only 30% of budgets for health and education were allocated by September 2021. Yet the Home Affairs, Army, CIO and President's Office budgets were over allocated. Recently, the army and police received pay increases, but teachers and nurses are still struggling with poultry pay. Both BT and Mugano said the investment climate in Zimbabwe is very poor. The Zimbabwe is open for business declaration by Mnangagwa is pure political rhetoric with no substance. Mugano said investment inflows into Zimbabwe amounted to 1.1% of the national GDP from investors. In the 1990s, it was 20 to 25% of the national GDP. However, the elephant in the room of this economic free fall is corruption. 
it is estimated that Zimbabwe is losing more than 1 billion US dollars every year to corruption. Worse still, the Munangago government is silent on the issue of corruption. Munangagwa made fun of corruption when he told a rally that many people had asked him what happened to the 15 US billion dollars that the late Mugabe said had disappeared. Munangagwa said he was also asked what he was going to do about corruption. Munangagwa's answer in Shona was, Ndakaona kuti ini ndaiwe ndiri muhuru mende, saka ndakati regandi nyarare. I noticed that I was in the government that was accused of corruption, so I decided to keep quiet and not to answer the question. Munangagwa also said in answer to what he was going to do about corruption, again in Shona he said, Mumwe akandi tumiratsamba achiti ano ziwa wanu wakaba marie hurumende. Ini ndikamuti musoro wako nyarara. Someone sent me a letter in which he revealed individuals who had engaged in corruption. I said to him, shut the F up. For years, Mnangagwa and ZANU PF have been quiet on the crime of corruption. It's only recently that some members of ZANU PF are now calling for a statement on corruption. Munangagwa is protected by the constitution which says he cannot be called before parliament. And as he always stated, he decided to keep quiet about it a long time ago. The big question is, will Munangagwa agree to testify before parliament? Or will he invoke his privileges not to attend? If he decides not to attend, what will Parliament do? Does Parliament have sufficient courage to impeach him? Or will they abandon their demand for Munangagwa to, to appear? After all, ZANU-PF has a big majority to decide how Parliament will react. Summoning the president to parliament is a sign of the changing times, however. National dissatisfaction with the ZANU-PF government is now making inroads within the party itself. This is because a few members of ZANU-PF are getting the lion's share of what the late Bishop Desmond Tutu once called the gravy train. The billions of dollars that are being looted are not shared equitably among the ZANU-PF aparichiki. Some, like Tagwirei, are getting a lion's share. Others are getting pittance or nothing. Worse still, members of the army, police, CIO, and war veterans are getting the raw deal. They are at the bottom end, but they do most of the dirty work in inflicting violence on civilians on behalf of ZANU-PF. ZANU-PF's unquenchable thirst for violence, hooliganism, and intimidation are now a well-known brand of the party under the mantra ZANU Ndeye Ropa. Recent events show that ZANU PF insanity with violence is surging exponentially to a new level. In response, Triple C youth have issued a warning that the party will meet head on with anyone who tries to destroy or disrupt the people's project as 
as a triple C deputy spokesperson Ostalos Siziba pointed out recently. The late Oliver Mtukudzi sang Matare Ezibakera Hana Zano Shanda. Violence does not serve any purpose. Triple C's official policy is that it will use constitutional and legal methods to campaign and will not engage in violent activities. However, everyone recognizes and agrees that anybody has a right to defend themselves when attacked. The use of violence in self-defense in the face of an attack is recognized as legitimate by the international law. In the past, ZANU-PF thugs used to inflict violence on MDCT supporters without suffering the consequences of their actions. In a confrontation that resembled ZANU and ZAPU way back in the 1960s, ZANU-PF youths tried to stop Triple C youths from their door-to-door -door campaigning in Chitungwiza. This was not an isolated incident, but a well-crafted strategy of ZANU-PF behavior that has its historical foundations in the entire life of the party. What this means is violence and intimidation are ingrained in ZANU-PF's DNA. To give a few examples of these acts of insanity by ZANU-PF. A reputable journalist goats were under threat of seizure. A ZANU-PF thugs publicly boasted that he was going to seize the journalist goats. He said he was taking this action in response to people in the area who were unhappy that their promised goats had not been delivered. But the same villagers in Murewa and other well-wishers formed a citizen's resistance force and scared the hell out of the ZANU-PF thugs. The people stopped him. A vendor was barred from selling ice cream at the trade fair because he was wearing a yellow jacket. Can you imagine that? Triple C campaigners were barred by ZANU-PF thugs and strangely enough, the police from campaigning in Chitungwiza, Triple C members came in their hundreds for a confrontation with the thugs. An elected mayor in Harare had his election invalidated by local government minister. But the acting mayor has stood his ground in defiance. A speaker at a ZANU-PF rally stated that ZANU-PF will continue to use violence to protect Zimbabwe from foreign uh, interests. Corruption is one of the long list of factors that account for ZANU-PF misrule and looting. The other factor is violence and lack of respect for basic human rights. ZANU-PF is running Zimbabwe like it's a private pro property for the party. There is a very simple explanation for ZANU-PF's autocratic behavior. ZANU-PF is now a shadow of its former self. ZANU-PF would lose decisively in any free and fair election. So it has to resort to violence, corruption, and rigging of elections to survive. In the past, ZANU-PF engaged in violence as if it, it had a right and monopoly to inflict it over Zimbabweans. But now things are changing. 
the new generation of Zimbabweans with their yellow mantra are now confronting ZANU-PF. Young progressive Zimbabweans have now realized that ZANU-PF is easy Risina Manyanga. A number of instances where ZANU-PF thugs tried to intimidate were met with stiff resistance. An attempt to abduct Makombo in Awashe failed dismally when local people rescued him in a dramatic confrontation. On the occasion of Press Freedom Day, Zimbabwe is very far behind in when it comes to respect uh, freedom of expression and the press as fundamental human rights. According to the United States 2020 country reports on human rights practices in Zimbabwe, numerous factors contributed to a flawed overall election process, including one, the Zimbabwe Election Commission's lack of independence and partiality heavily biased the state media favoring the ruling party, voter intimidation and constitutional influence of tribal leaders, disenfranchisement of alien and diaspora voters, failure to provide a preliminary voter's role in electronic format, politicization of food aid, security services excessive use of force, and lack of precision and transparency around the release of election results. The Constitution, the Zimbabwean Constitution, provides for freedom of expression and of the media. But the law limits these freedoms in the so-called interests of defense, public security, or professional confidentiality. The government has continued to arrest, detain, and harass journalists and critics, while independent media continued to operate. Journalists and editors practiced self-censorship. Government failure to investigate or prosecute attacks on human rights defenders and peaceful protesters led to a de facto restriction on freedom of expression, assembly, and association. Zimbabwe has only one locally based TV station that is government owned and controlled. All other countries in the SADC region have multiple TV stations that are independently owned. And this speaks volumes about media freedom in Zimbabwe. According to Tony Rilla, writing in the publication The Daily Maverick, the latest in the repressive laws in Zimbabwe are the proposed amendment, amendments to the Private Voluntary Organizations Act. And this reflects how deeply the ZANU-PF government fears its citizens. NGOs in Zimbabwe enjoy a much higher confidence ranking from the citizens than the government leaders. A survey by the Afro Barometer showed that 79% of Zimbabweans trust NGOs. Rila notes that while this law, Private Voluntary Organization Act, is ostensibly to prevent money laundering for terrorist activities. Section 6.1 clearly shows the intent of the government. It makes it a criminal offense for NGOs to provide funding to political parties. These actions by the ZANU-PF government under Mnangagwa that clearly deprive Zimbabweans of their basic human rights show what the government must not do if it wants sanctions to be lifted. As the situation continues to deteriorate in the country, the nationwide dissatisfaction or discontent with ZANU-PF 
is now pushing the party to seek a dialogue with the triple C, which is now a political force in the country. The problem is ZANU-PF will try to set conditions for this dialogue in order to give the false impression that it is the triple C that is desperate for talks. One condition is that Chamisa and the triple C must dissociate itself from statements made by Lord Jonathan Oates in the British Parliament. Mr. Oates said MDCT under Monzora was a puppet, is a puppet of ZANU-PF. He also said the by-elections were not held on a level playing field. In the past, ZANU-PF has pushed MDC Alliance and now Triple C to denounce sanctions. There are two glaring fallacies in these demands by ZANU-PF. First, Lord Oates statements were true. The by-election was not held on a level playing field. That is a fact and ZANU-PF knows it. Secondly, Mwanzora was given on a silver platter the Morgan Richard Trangirai building by ZANU-PF after it had been taken away by armed police from the rightful owners, MDC Alliance led by Chamisa. Third, under Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe's Political Parties Finance Act, the 149 million $850,000 which was due to the MDC alliance led by Chamisa was forcibly taken away and given to Monzora. Fourth, only triple C rallies were harassed and in some cases banned by the police, while Monzora's tiny meetings, poorly attended meetings, went ahead without any problems from the police. On the question of sanctions, ZANU-PF is the cause of the punitive measures imposed by the international financial institutions. These sanctions were imposed for two reasons. Zimbabwe defaulted on its debt repayment to international financial institutions. Two, Zimbabwe has an abysmal human rights uh, abuse record. And ZANU-PF knows that for sanctions to be lifted, Mnangagwa and ZANU-PF must repay their debts and res respect basic human rights. Triple C has absolutely nothing to do with the sanctions. This is a bilateral matter between ZANU-PF and the international community. This concludes today's broadcast of Letter from America, a weekly in-depth analysis of the situation in Zimbabwe. Thank you for listening. This concludes today's broadcast of Letter from America, a weekly in-depth analysis of the situation in Zimbabwe. Thank you for listening. This concludes today's broadcast of Letter from America, a weekly in-depth analysis of the situation in Zimbabwe. Thank you for listening. This concludes today's broadcast of Letter from America, a weekly in-depth analysis.